sean bienvenidas y bienvenidos a esta nueva sesión de FIE, a, del Foro de Innovación Editorial, que realiza la Cámara Nacional de la Industria Editorial Mexicana, en conjunto con el Centro de Innovación y Desarrollo Editorial Editamos. Hoy tenemos una invitada especial y un tema muy particular, que tiene que ver con las tendencias y qué está haciendo y qué está pasando en el mundo más allá de nuestro entorno, a hoy día hiperconectado, por cierto. Pero necesitábamos saber um, cuáles son las tendencias que está sucediendo en el, en el medio editorial internacional y cómo México y cómo nosotros estamos sumándonos, o aún no, a, a estas, a estas a nuevas formas de trabajo y visiones de mundo. Esta sesión será, como se anunció desde el principio, será en inglés, puesto que Emma House, que en este minuto voy a presentar, es su lengua materna. Ella maneja bastante bien el español, ya estuvimos haciendo algunas pruebas, pero um, las preguntas pueden ser en inglés o en español vía chat, uh, y ya estaré aquí para, para ayudarnos y ayudarle en, en lo que sea necesario uh, en esta sesión. Dicho lo anterior, agradezco uh, enormemente tanto la presencia de ustedes como la de Emma, que eh, tiene un currículum bastante interesante, porque es consultora internacional editorial con una carrera en la industria editorial mundial que abarca más de 20 años. Ocupó altos cargos en la Feria del Libro de Londres y la Asociación de Editores del Reino Unido antes de, de, poner, de expandirse como eh, consultora. Su, carrera, su cartera de clientes abarca importantes organizaciones de ferias comerciales, asociaciones comerciales nacionales, nuevas empresas de tecnología educativa, empresas de tecnología, organizaciones benéficas de alfabetización, organizaciones artísticas nacionales y empresas sociales. Emma es fideicomisaria del Publishing Training Center en UK y miembro de la Junta de Publish Her un movimiento global para promover y fomentar la igualdad de género en la educación y en la publicación, miembro también de la Junta Asesora del Oxford International Center of Publishing y asesora del programa eh, LDN, uh, LDNL, uh, Apprenticeship for Publishing Assistant. Emma tiene un, un, un BA, un Business Administration, Honors en Español y en Ciencias Empresariales. Emma, muy bienvenida. Tenemos aquí un público ávido de escuchar qué está pasando y cómo se está desarrollando el, el, el mercado editorial, el negocio editorial en el mundo. Adelante, bienvenida. Bueno, buenos días a todos y muchas gracias para invitarme a hablar con, con toda la gente aquí. Y lo siento que hablaré en inglés, pero no tengo mucha con, con, confidencia en hablar en español en este uh, setting. Um, voy a... ¿Se puede ver? Sí. Sí. Pues, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for the kind introduction, Mario. Um, as, as Mario said, my name is Emma House. I'm an international publishing consultant and Before setting up my own consultancy business, I worked for the London Book Fair and the UK Publishers Association. And in those roles and in my current role, I've had the privilege of really gaining insight and knowledge into publishing companies, large, medium and small across the world, working closely with them and with publishing trade associations, as well as suppliers to the publishing industry. And now my business focus on um, event curation, event management, working closely with book fairs and conferences, publishing industry research and managing various different projects, especially in the literacy space and business development. So I want to talk about the key issues facing our industry. And there are, of course, many day-to-day -day challenges of running a publishing company, especially around cash flow, around finding authors, around managing customers and ensuring the right staff are in place, and that the operation of, of running um, a publishing company goes smoothly. On a higher industry-wide level, however, there are three topics which are consistent 
and they never go away. They just take very different forms. Um, these are issues which are generally tackled at an industry level, often by publishers associations. They are indeed the three main pillars of the International Publishers Association. And they are crucial to the success and failure of our industry. And are topics in which every publishing business and supplier to the publishing industry should be engaged and should support national and international trade bodies to tackle. So the first one is copyright and piracy. In a world where copyright law is ever changing and evolving, as rights holders, we need to ensure we are consistently promoting the value of copyright and the need for a strong copyright regime that allows for investment in our creators mm -hmm. and in our industry. The value and importance of Copyright is a message that needs to be given to policymakers and consumers alike. And there are some countries such as Canada and South Africa where the creative industries and especially publishing are fighting a losing battle with outcomes that are seeing uh, legal copying of our works being permitted, but also allowing piracy to become rampant. And this is one of the biggest threats to our industry. Freedom to publish, and perhaps more topical at the moment, is freedom to read. This is a core principle of our industry and, again, is under many threats in many countries, both those with stringent censorship regimes that apply across the country, but also those where books are now being banned due to the nature of their content. As we know, this is particularly topical in the US right now, where in, in this year alone, 27 US states have introduced a record total of 50 bills that would restrict access to books in schools and libraries. And five of these laws have now been enacted into law. And finally, literacy and developing the readers of the future. It's a big and important responsibility for us as publishers to promote and tackle. So as I mentioned, these are three key areas of work for the International Publishers Association, but also national associations and do provide a role for every publisher to play an active role in. So with the current overview that I've got of the global publishing industry, I've selected six topics that I know publishers around the world are grappling with at a senior level. And I'm not saying I've got all of the answers for you today, indeed far from it, but I can give an insight into the considerations around these topics. In the last 10 to 20 years, we've seen seismic changes in the publishing industry, thanks to technology. We've developed new formats, new distribution channels, and created opportunities to reach more readers with more books more easily and in some cases in more cost-effective ways. The supply chains have adapted, marketing channels have become more immediate, more personalized and more agile. However, we are publishing more books than ever before, notably with the ease and cost of self-publishing and the advent of print on demand, making it a much busier space for books, harder to discover titles, and cut through the noise to make the success of each title. But we still keep publishing more. Each of our sectors, whether it's academic and STM publishing, schools publishing and consumer trade publishing, have faced their own challenges. We've seen the, the emergence and ongoing debate around open access for journal publishing. We're seeing a global lack of funding and support for schools publishing, especially. And our sectors have grown more distinct from each other than before. But there are a number of global trends which unite the industry and which we're facing together. Some of these challenges are more profound in different markets. Um, and we are learning from each other all the time. We often find ourselves at different stages of development. And we can therefore learn from what's happening in one country 
to another country. And what we're seeing in technology is often adopted by the academic and STM sector before it reaches other sectors. But with the spread and the emergence of, of these technologies, the global industry is changing once again. And artificial intelligence especially has forced us into a new chapter. So I'm going to go through these six areas of, of trends and how they're impacting our sector and, and particularly what publishing leaders around the world are currently considering. So let's start with artificial intelligence. And I know that um, if you've attended a session previous to this one um, under this banner of the Foro, then um, I know you've had a session on artificial intelligence already. But as a business leader in any sector, I think you're going to be planning for what the impact will have on your industry and your own personal business. Um, and certainly publishing is no exception. So when it comes to AI as a business leader, you'll want to be considering how this technology can damage my business. How can it help my business? And what are the policy and legal considerations I need to be thinking about? And I think Maria Palante, who is the CEO and the president of the Association of American Publishers, noted at, the, at their annual general meeting on May the 8th earlier this year, she noted that the AAP, the Association of American Publishers, is engaged on two categories of questions, principles and policies. And when it comes to principles, these are really ethics questions such as the authenticity of content, accuracy, provenance, and the objectives. So looking at academic and scientific publishing, each year there's over 2 million articles published um, following peer review and curation, but it's essential to ensure integrity and confidence and research results. So how, how can AI tools really help with this mission and what threats does it pose? Looking at educational publishing, um, there's an old saying that people are entitled to their own opinions, but not to their own facts. So what are the facts in the context of AI? Who do we trust? Who do we believe? Is it just a percentage of truth? And how will learning be amplified? And how can uh, cheating be contained? And consider trade publishing. Do we as a society want AI generated works flooding the internet and flooding the market, potentially really depressing the value of human authorship? And if we can't contain AI generated works, what are the ethics around disclosing their provenance? And then looking at policies, there are competing questions about how the law should treat both the ingestion and the output respectively. So how should the law protect the underlying content, including books, which is used to train AI models? Those are the inputs. And how should it protect the works generated by the AI models? And those are the outputs and, and who indeed owns those outputs. So I've listed out on, on these two slides and you will have access to these slides after the presentation, but there are many ways in which AI can be explored and implemented to benefit a trade publishing company. Of course, as we mentioned, there are legal and ethical considerations around the applications of AI, especially when it comes to content curation and translation. However, general areas around marketing, data, analysts, data analysis, proofreading and copy editing can certainly be made more efficient through the use of AI technologies. And we are already seeing a multitude of different companies offering the technology to assist in these areas. But in, an important consideration will be striking a balance between automation and human intervention. What many of these applications of AI will lead to, of course, is the consideration of publishing skills required in the future. What are the jobs of the future? Will we need proofreaders? Will we need translators? Will we need audiobook narrators? And of course, this isn't going to change in the immediate future. 
but it will change. And in the meantime, experimentation and investment is required with research into technology providers and analysis of the efficiencies and the effectiveness that AI technology can bring to the workflow. The use of AI in educational publishing is not new. Um, many educational publishers have been using AI technology for a good few years. And what their experience has shown us is that by really thoughtfully integrating AI into educational publishing, you can enhance the learning experiences of students, you can empower educators, make their lives much easier, allow them to focus on what they're really good at around teaching and contribute to the advancement of modern teaching methodologies. But I think what's really important to, to note is, is to approach AI implementation with a real focus on pedagogical goals and ethical considerations to ensure that technology really does enhance the educational process. Also to note, as, as, as Maria pointed out in her principles, is the use of generative AI to actually generate the content that will be used to teach our learners cannot be relied on to be factually correct. It could also struggle to generate a consistent tone and style that textbook authors have perfected over the years. But what it can do is provide suggestions on language use, guidance on how to adapt levels as needed, can also analyze the overall structure of a textbook and identify areas that need improvement and offer recommendations for restructuring or rephrasing. Condensing really complex ideas into concise explanations can also be challenging for authors. And this is where generative AI can come into play, creating clear and informative explanatory texts and summaries with its ability to really analyze vast amounts of data. And this can be really beneficial when preparing abstracts or chapter summaries to highlight critical concepts within a textbook. So the transformation from the printed textbook to AI powered platforms for educational content will of course require considerable investment and experimentation as well as the systematic buy-in from the whole of the education system, from governments to educators, to parents, to training colleges, and all of the other players in the education ecosystem. Again, there's legal and ethical considerations around data privacy and security concerns when collecting and using student data. So ensuring compliance with relevant regulations and being transparent about how AI is used to enhance educational experiences will be important considerations for the publishing industry. Publishers will also need to really regularly assess the effectiveness of AI integrated educational materials and platforms, constantly gathering feedback from educators and students and parents to refine and improve the AI driven features. I wanted to start the academic slides with this information from the CEO of Elsevier, Kumsul Bayezid, again from the AAP AGM this year. She reinforced the fact that academic publishers have been using AI technology for a couple of decades. However, it is the generative AI that's going to be a game changer for publishers, certainly for academic and STM publishers. And uh, for those academic publishers that are on, on the call, I don't know if you, you follow um, the Scholarly Kitchen, but there was um, an excellent post very recently by um, uh, an employee of Wiley, where he outlines the ways in which Wiley have been testing various AI tools and what the outcomes have been. And I do recommend that this um, that this is it, that this is uh, read by everybody. So I posted the link on this, but it will be circulated afterwards as well. 
And so there are indeed many opportunities, again, from the use of AI tools in academic publishing. But again, it needs to be systematic, where everybody needs buy-in uh, from the publishing company through to the researchers, the reviewers, the editors, and of course, the end users. And training and resources will need to be provided to researchers and reviewers and editors to fully engage with AI technology. And as Wiley have proven, testing and investing in new technologies is, is what um, is being recommended. So moving on to the, the subject of, of AI and copyright. So the core role of the publisher is to generate and package intellectual property. And it's in this space around where issues around authorship, copyright and AI systems still need to be resolved. And until a legal framework is established, publishers and content creators must be extremely vigilant to avoid copyright infringement in AI generated works. I'm going to post another link here. So it's a link to a YouTube channel uh, uh, presentation from the Read Imagine conference, which took place a couple of months ago in Madrid, um, where there's a very good explanation around AI as well. So uh, something that I would recommend. Emma? Sí. Um, quisiera decirle al público que Emma está poniendo estos, estas ligas, pero se les enviará a ustedes posteriormente. La idea es que se den el chat, pero ustedes van a tener un documento y la presentación también para que puedan explorar con mayor certeza este, estas ligas, para no interrumpir uh, la atención. Ese, ese exactamente, es exactamente. Adelante. Um, another technology that has the potential to impact our industry in a positive way is augmented reality. Again, not a new technology and publishers have been experimenting with augmented reality over the years, bringing to life fairy tales, children's content, as well as educational content. And there are many advantages that can be demonstrated of using AR in all kinds of books, which I've mentioned here. Consideration again needs to be given to the pedagogical value it can add to the printed book, rather than it just being a gimmick. But there are many reasons why publishers are considering trialing the use of augmented reality in their books. And there are many suppliers on the market for the provision of AR technology. But one that's been in the news recently that I'm most familiar with is a Norwegian based company called Ludenso, who is working with a number of publishers offering their AR authoring tool. They've announced a recent partnership with Books of Discovery in the US where the CEO noted that together we will push the boundaries of traditional textbooks and provide students with an unparalleled learning experience. Our augmented reality process com combined with Books of Discovery's expertise will revolutionise the way students engage with educational content, making learning more interactive, more captivating and more effective. And the CEO of Books of Discovery said this partnership opens the doors for students immediate access to digital content through mobile devices whilst working off our printed pages. And the augmented reality has the power to expand our textbooks and become a gateway to immersive learning, transforming traditional methods and empowering a new generation of learners. So again, a, an interesting te technology to look forward to um, and learn about and engage with. So moving on from future technologies, but not too far, the subject of distribution and the supply chain is on the top of everyone's minds. As I noted in my introduction, the publishing supply chain has evolved to match the advances in technology and of course, new forms of publishing. We've now got firmly established distribution channels for print, eBooks and audio books in all languages to ensure that books can reach all four, four corners of the globe. The pandemic, however, did disrupt the supply chain with many unforeseen consequences 
in areas such as paper supply, disruptions in printing locations, especially in the Far East, shipping causing costs to rise exponentially, and a shortage in paper, and of course the time delay in getting books to market. So what publishers are grappling with now is, what is the future of paper? Can we rationalize the different types of paper that we're using? Paper mills around the world are closing down or switching their focus away from books and onto packaging. And in time, this could cause a global shortage of paper suitable for, for books. We're also thinking about where do we print our books? The aftermath of the pandemic saw publishers grappling with the lack of ability to print in China, especially four colour children's books and sought solutions much closer to home. Um, we've seen um, a swift return to printing in China, but the over-reliance of printing in China has caused the industry to reflect on the impact this has had on their publishing businesses and, and where do we print in the future. Other questions being asked are, do we still want to be shipping printed books around the globe? The advancement of print on demand solutions is giving publishing the opportunity to diversify how and where they print, having a distributed print strategy, which is reducing warehousing costs and managing inventory in a much more effective way, as well as printing books closer to the consumer. How do we ensure we have a robust physical supply chain as well as a robust digital supply chain in the future? And with a market share of, of eBooks and audiobooks continuing to grow, how do we ensure our books are available on every platform? So this ties very nicely in with the next topic that I want to touch on, which is sustainability and the increasing demand for publishers to become carbon net zero and consider their environmental impact. As an industry, we've been under pressure for many years from some lobbying groups concerned about the impact publishing has on forests, for example, and with the industry responding by using paper from renewable sources and recycled paper. But the pressure is really on now for us to consider every aspect of our industry and see how we can reduce our carbon footprint across the board. So it's not only political and consumer pressure that's encouraging to look at this matter. There's also the commercial imperative. And I think this, this quote from PwC um, sums it up very nicely. Organisations are seeking to demonstrate that they're taking positive action on, on net zero and the ones that act early will enjoy a competitive advantage over those that don't. We can also expect legal imperatives down the line as well. There is new regulation being introduced in Europe aimed at all large companies and all listed companies, including SMEs, to disclose information on what they see as the risks and opportunities arising from so social and environmental issues and what the impact of their activities is on people and the environment. So this is known as the Corporate Sustainability Re Reporting Directive, which may eventually be rolled out elsewhere and of course to smaller companies. So how are publishers tackling this? Firstly, by understanding what their carbon footprint is. And this is across scopes one, two and three. So across direct emissions that their own business is making, but also the indirect or the value chain emissions that the supply chain is producing. So steps that publishers are considering in order to reduce the carbon emissions in their business and across their supply chain range from internal activities and internal operations such as their offices and office buildings, business travel, events, but also looking at products. What are they made of? Paper, ink, glue, and what steps the suppliers are taking to reduce carbon in their own operations 
And that's from printers to freight forwarders to warehousing operations. And more demands are being made of suppliers to the publishing industry by the publishers to demonstrate what steps they are taking to reduce their carbon emissions. And of course, these are topics that are increasingly discussed on the international stage at book fairs, at conferences and in the international trade press. Um, but it's a matter that's that's going to be increasingly important. And remaining with uh, sustainability, a publishing, a publishing industry initiative concerned with sustainability that I know Caniem has been championing is, this, is the SDG Publishers Compact, which was launched in collaboration with the International Publishers Association and aims to accelerate progress to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. So it's really designed to inspire action amongst publishers and those working in the publishing industry. The signatories aspire to develop sustainable practices and act as champions of the SDGs during this decade of action that will include publishing books and journals to help inform, develop and inspire action in that direction. The SDG Book Club is another industry initiative that's been designed to help children learn about the Sustainable Development Goals. And the book club features books in English, French, Spanish, Arabic and Russian with new chapters now in Africa, Brazil, Germany, Indonesia, Norway and Portugal. And the selection of books is now complete and available to see on the UM website. And uh, for academic publishers, the um, STM organisation has also recently introduced a roadmap that contains su suggested um, uh, concrete steps for, for publishers to take um, including a dedicated toolkit of resources. So I've posted that link and we will again share that afterwards. So that is really aimed at academic publishers, but I think it's worth everybody taking a look at and um, it's free to access all of the resources. So moving on to discoverability and reaching readers. A publisher recently said to me, it's really easy to publish a book. If you've got the money to invest up front, we've got a sea of authors, it's not difficult to publish a book. But it's much more difficult to sell a book. Um, so going back to the literacy side of things, um, we have over 750 million adults around the world that still cannot read and write a simple statement. And two thirds of those are women. Adult literacy rates are the lowest in sub-Saharan sub Africa and Southern Asia. And as publishers, we must take tackling illiteracy seriously and consider this in our corporate social responsibility efforts, as well as an industry, uh, as an industry, as well as individually. But also tackling this will help us commercially. And it's up to us also to make books interesting, educational and enjoyable. So when it comes to book marketing, however, digital tools and social media, if you take the time and effort to invest in these activities, can really increase books visibility and attract a wider range um, of audiences and readers. And again, the AI tools that we talked about earlier will help on this. I'm not going to spend too much time going through this checklist uh, for discovery of books, but um, these will be available afterwards. And of course, making books available in all formats, so print, ebooks, and increasingly audio, will also help to reach and develop readers. And I just wanted to, to um, say a note here on audio. And again, I know that um, you've had a presentation recently from Zebralution on audiobooks, but it is the fastest growing format in many countries. You can see some statistics here on uh, uh, the growth in audiobooks, as well as Storytel's forecast of the future of the format. And of course, audio is expensive to create and careful consideration needs to be given to business models to ensure there is fair compensation for the publisher and the author. But at least audio is not reliant on the physical 
distribution network that we've considered earlier on and does does not carry the risks of returns which is an issue that's causing many concerns in the print market as well. <clears throat> so as well as ensuring our books are available in different formats, we must not also forget the audience of print impaired people. Digital books have opened up a whole new world for this audience. And of course, commercially for publishers who can now reach readers who previously could not buy and read the books that we printed. Again, we've got a commercial, moral and legal duty to ensure that our books are made accessible. In Europe, we have uh, legislation that's been introduced across all European countries called the European Accessibility Act, which covers a wide range of goods and services such as ATMs, smartphones, ticketing and checking machines. But it also specifically covers websites and e-commerce and ebooks and it covers not only the businesses based in the eu but also those who have audiences that are based in the eu so selling ebooks in spanish to a spanish audience then they will need to comply with the european accessibility act and we've also got the global marrakesh treaty to which uh, mexico is a signatory and was an early adopter Moving on to diversity, equality and inclusion is a very hot topic in many countries and in, on the top of minds of many publishing leaders around the world, um, particularly in the English language markets, but I know in other markets as well. Diversity, equality and in inclusion is now a job function within a publishing house and larger companies will often have various committees looking at different aspects of D, E and I. It's a topic being discussed at trade association levels who are supporting publishers at many levels and the International Publishers Association has a committee dedicated to this subject. And in the scholarly world, there is the Coalition for Diversity and Inclusion in Scholarly Communications. And of course, this is all encompassing of ethnicity, gender, disabilities, including mental disabilities, mental health, sexuality, and socioeconomic diversity. Publishers are taking this very seriously, again, from a commercial, moral, and legal standpoint. We see an activity uh, divided into two areas. Firstly, in content, efforts are being made to ensure books and journals authentically reflect our diverse audiences including the representation of marginalised authors, as well as um, helping authors in their development and meet market demands. There's a recognition that children especially need to see themselves reflected in the books that they read. Books play an important role in shaping children's lives, and these stories and characters will affect how they see themselves and the world around them. And of course, there is a commercial and moral imperative to bring about change to make sure that books are more representative. And this isn't limited to just children's books. Efforts are being made to ensure all, all books and journals authentically reflect our diverse audiences, increasing the representation of marginalized authors as well. Diversity in the workforce, the publishing industry's top assets is its employees. If you don't have diverse employees, you don't have diverse books. And so the industry is also reimagining in pathways into the industry to ensure that the workforce is representative, it is diverse. So considering things like internships, apprenticeships, work experience, and supporting those from different backgrounds with different abilities, looking at different ways of recruitment, prioritizing retention, and advancement as well as professional development for employees. And as such, we're getting more books into more readers' hands and not publishing um, for, for a few uh, aspects of society. And here is, is a slide from Penguin Random House UK 
who have noted that their inclusion strategy has these three different aims. So it's about recruitment. It's about a culture in the workplace. And it's about publishing books that anyone can read and see themselves reflected in. And I think this sums up the uh, the approach to diversity and inclusion that many publishers are now taking. And I think this is a good topic to end on. This topic encompasses much of which I've spoken about throughout this presentation. When we're thinking about new technologies, changes to our supply chain, when we're thinking about sustainability, diversity, equity and inclusion, we're thinking about the publishing workforce at every point. And I think this is a cr crucial topic that's on everyone's mind. What does our workforce need to look like in 10 years time? What jobs will we need and how do we upskill our current workforce, but also attract those from other industries to consider publishing as a career? Not only will we need a diverse workforce, we will increasingly need people working on data an analysis, AI and automation experts, sustainability managers, blockchain and IP experts. And the publishing industry is dynamic and our future workforce will need to be adaptable, open to learning new skills and ready to embrace the emerging technologies in order to stay competitive. So I've reached the end of the formal part of our presentation, um, a real whiz through six aspects that, that I think publishing leaders are considering, what we're seeing talked about at book fairs, what we're seeing discussed at trade association level and what we're seeing at, at various conferences. Um, so I hope this has given food for thought and insight into these areas. Well, thank you very much, uh, Emma. And you have two questions here in the chat, if you want to go through it. And, I will, so, yeah. Uh, this is the informal part, which is could be more interesting and, and we're going to take some of our of your presentation, obviously. Of course. So the first one, how do you think independent publishing houses or family run businesses related to the book chain would tackle all of the uh, the challenges technology presents? And I think um, it's through experimentation. I think it's through trial and error. I think it's about attending conferences, reading the trade press, following what the bigger publishers are doing um, as well. I think um, learning from each other, being part of trade associations where best practice are being discussed, committees are being set up. Um, and, and don't try and do everything at once, take it one step at a time um, and work on those that are really gonna benefit your business. So when you see my slides, you'll be able to go through and look at the different aspects of publishing and think, well, you know, do I tackle marketing first? Do I tackle production first? Start with the easy areas. Um, there's another one here. I wanted to share a living experience when it comes to disabilities and what those can contribute in terms of intelligence and everything that brings to the table. Those with physical disabilities can bring so much. And I think that's true. I think that's not, not only in the content that we publish, but it's also about the work culture as well. Um, I, I had a very interesting experience recently where working with um, a body that represents dwarfs, people with dwarfism, short people, who uh, are always portrayed in books as clowns or, um, you know, the, the seven dwarfs, they, they're, they're not good people. So the portrayal of small people with, with those kind of physical disabilities always have a very poor representation in, in books, especially children's books. And there was a call upon the publishing industry to present people with dwarfism in a much more positive light. Um, so I completely agree with the contribution that uh, people with disabilities can bring to the publishing industry and much more needs to happen to embrace them and support them to come into our industry. Um, in the face of AI, 
what are the most urgent tasks for academic journals? Um, so I, I would very much go to the, the Wiley um, article in the Scholarly Kitchen where they, they've been testing these uh, different augment uh, uh, artificial intelligence ones. I think editorial workflow is probably the most prominent one. Um, I think there are some real efficiencies that can be made in the editorial workflow. Um, manuscript screening, um, checking for plagiarism, editing, formatting, um, and then followed by content discovery as well. So those are the two key areas that I would say, but certainly the editorial workflow. And that, that probably applies to um, trade publishing as well. I mean, AI tools are, are very much being used in the marketing space, but but certainly there's some real efficiencies that can be brought about in the editorial process. So, um, uh, you, uh, what, as, I, I, uh, as, a, as a consultant, uh, what is the main issue your your clients are interested in working on? Um, I've got a whole range of, of of different clients, so it's hard to say, but I think. The supply chain is one of the key ones and how to tackle sustainability and environmental impact, how to become net zero um, is really high on people's agendas. Um, and, and the bigger publishers, especially that, that sell books around the world, are thinking we shouldn't be shipping books around the world, printing in one country, shipping to another country warehousing them and then shipping them out again around the world the journey of the book is just um causing too much environmental damage so how do we have what what we're calling a distributed print strategy so printing in country closer to customers and avoiding that um uh, uh shipping of books but also waste you know not having too many books left over in the inventory and discouraging returns. So I think that's probably something that comes up the most. Software or digital platforms that use AI to recommend in editorial management. So um, there's one company that I will post on the chat, um, uh, which is based out of India. I'm just gonna put, put it in the chat. Um, Something that I've come across, I've, I've, I've been through their presentation and I found them quite interesting. I will put, put it on the chat. But there are lots of lots of companies out there um, and more will come out as well. But there's one. It's, that's an example to look at. That's the kind of company that I, I think um, we're going to see much more emerging. Um, what changes can we expect about the concept of authorship? So I think there's two things there. One is creating the content and presenting it to a publisher to publish and uh, being transparent about the AI generative aspect of that. Um, I think, you know, there will be people out there that are going to self-publish using AI tools. Um, and there will be lots of questions there about who owns the copyright to that book. But I think, as I said, AI tools can be used by authors, um, particularly in some of the academic and educational spaces where it can help um, condense and explain complex concepts. But I think um, it's really going to be around um, authorship and transparency of authors and, and who owns the copyright and, and where has the content come from. Um, I want, just a second. Um, please, uh, por favor, um, Claudia Alcalá nos hizo favor de poner el, el formulario de satisfacción o de salida, si tienen un momento para poder completarlo en lo que va terminando, Emma, se los agradeceríamos. Perdón. Está bien, está bien, está bien. <laughs> um, how can a business really take advantage of it all? Now, as I said, I think there's there's really dividing into editorial workflows, marketing tools, um, uh, and 
what was the other area I was thinking and yeah data driven decision making and I mean I think that's that's a lot that 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 that's a bit harder than the other two things I think the you know um drafting drafting um, marketing copy for example I I know publishers that are using AI tools to put the entire book in and create the blurb that comes on the back of a book for example so it, it can really save you time it can come up with some really good uh, marketing things proofreading um, particularly through grammar and spelling checks I think that would really help um, uh, and, and market analysis so I think those three are the, are the first three areas to to come into but there are lots of ways in which a business could take advantage I'd say look at the efficiencies that it can cr can create uh the next one's in spanish let me just see it exists the possibility exists to lose everything that ai take information to create your own text not quite sure what that question is from angelica yeah the question basically is all the references that all the the, the references and the data that the, the ai is taking um which is the limit for for that? I mean, it will be a limit of legal control of that, and um, to know where they took, uh, where exactly. they they fit each other uh, itself. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a very difficult one to control, and and you know, it's going to be controlled by legislation, um, and and. Author contracts, for example, um, the Authors Guild of America has model author contracts on their website and they've come up with a clause to go into the author contract, um, which says that the book may not be used for teaching machine learning. How that's enforced, I've got no idea, but it's a very interesting clause to look at. So um I'll add that link um, into what goes around. But the Authors Guild of America in their model contracts is looking at that. But as I say, how, how it's controlled. Um, <laughs> I like Patricia's comment. No, I just want to add that Japan is looking at that. Uh, European Union is looking at that. Of the whole of, uh, areas of the countries that are, is, is worried about that absolutely absolutely and it's it's very high on the priority lists of of publisher associations to to really look at the legislation that is in draft around artificial intelligence and make sure that publishers are represented in that um i think i think there is patricia you says there's no regulatory desire to limit this i'm i'm i think there is regul there there is regulatory desire to look at it and understand both sides of the coin I think the problem that that we're faced with is we're lobbying on one side but you've got powerful tech companies lobbying on the other side and governments are listening in both ears and we've got to be really strong and and forceful about our our side of the of, of the occasion of, of what's being discussed as well um it yeah it will be difficult it it's something that we've really got to watch yeah. uh children's markets what can you do to attract readers same formula as ones used to attract adults um no i think it's different i think i think children's um books and reading are, are quite different i think to attract children children still prefer the printed books what we are seeing is the use of podcasting now as a marketing tool to sell children's books. So I think that's one area that's quite different to adults is, is using podcasts and, and audio to really attract children to reading in a way that's different to, um, to, to adult books. And I'll, I'll share, I'll share a link on that as well in, in our, in our roundup as well um i think obviously when you're you're marketing children's books you're you're marketing to adults because they're the ones that are buying the books um and so it's just making sure that that those 
um, you know, what are kids going to learn out of this? Is is it going to be reading for pleasure as well as educational? Um, and I, I think the diversity question has been really powerful when it comes to children. In the UK, for example, all princesses are portrayed with long blonde hair, you know, and, and white faces. We don't have black print, black faced princesses. We don't have princesses that wear glasses. We don't have princesses that wear disabilities. And I think that um, by now introducing through different illustrations and characteristics that there is a commercial imperative. Children can walk into a bookshop or a library and see a cover with a child with a black face on it, a character with a black face on it and see themselves represented. So I think illustration is really powerful as well, particularly covers. Um, which publishing companies in the world move within the net zero approach? Well, certainly all of the bigger ones and the bigger European ones are because of the uh, legislation that's coming in that's going to impact them. Um, uh, for example, that. The academic ones are probably a bit more advanced than the um, uh, than the trade publishing ones. So companies like Wiley, Springer Nature, Elsevier have very comprehensive uh, carbon net zero goals and have pathways to how they're going to achieve that. But I think, yes, they are going to um, uh it is going to be for everybody. There's even small publishing companies, for example, in France that I've been speaking to who are really looking at the glue that they use, looking at the um, paper that they're using. They're experimenting with bamboo paper, with hemp paper, for example, that are not quite there in terms of quality and price, but hopefully will come, come in the future. So, so there's a lot of experimentation going on. Uh, publish her sure so there is um a website i'll put that up um so it's run by the previous president of the um international publishers association and um it's becoming much more present now in book fairs around the world so in the bologna book fair earlier this year publish her had a stand where it was showcasing books by women and for women and about women. And we had a series of talks talking about how to achieve gender equality in the publishing industry. Um, I write a, uh, um, a blog every month that appears on this website where we showcase um, a, a real champion female entrepreneur in publishing. We don't have one from Mexico yet. So um, I am looking for a Mexican candidate to include in my interview series. Um, but there are various things like toolkits, there's mentorship programs, um, there's get togethers at all of the book fairs as well. Um, and there is a push to try and um, have publish her chapters in different countries. So a publish her chapter has been set up in Brazil for the Brazilian publishing industry. They had um, a gathering at the Sao Paulo book fair. Um, so, so yeah, it's a movement that's growing. Men are welcome. Um, it's not only for women, but but it really is a platform for debate and support is, is how I would describe it, as well as showcasing all the brilliant female uh, publishing leaders that we have around the world. Thank you, Patricia, that's very kind of you. Um, I would I like to close. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I don't know if we've come to the end of our time, but um, it, thank you so much for everyone for attending and for all of your really interesting questions. Um, I've really enjoyed it. So thank you very much. No, muchísimas gracias a ti. Creo que todos quedamos muy contentos y con mucho trabajo. Mucho trabajo en repensar cómo uh, todos los elementos que nos, este, este set skill al final del día, ¿no? Skill sets que tenemos que ir el, repensar no solo el negocio, sino cómo atraer a uh, estas nuevas tecnologías uh, hacia un negocio orgánico, que vaya creciendo orgánicamente. Uh, muchísimas gracias por tu participación. Los dejamos invitados. Emma, muchísimas gracias y definitivamente estaremos en contacto.
para poder generar otro tipo de, de, de charlas, ¿no? Un poco más. Claro que más sí, tarde. claro que sí. Tengo mi email address y anyone can contact me. Gracias. Uh, también quiero invitar a toda la, la audiencia uh, a, a un tema fundamental, el tema de la ciberseguridad. Es nuestro próximo tema en el FIE 2023 y efectivamente eh, estar seguro que nuestros activos digitales están resguardados es una visión muy, muy importante. Nos vemos hasta la próxima. Muchísimas gracias a nombre de la Cámara y de Editamos. Uh, gracias a Claudia Alcalá, gracias a Sistemas. Gracias, Emma, nuevamente, y nos vemos la próxima. Gracias a todos. Bye.